I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. And uh, But I'm glad we're here. And uh, we have a special treat tonight. Brother Jeff Porter is with us. Uh, the Porters have been missionaries in South Africa since 1995, 20 years. Praise the Lord. And uh, I was trying to count your children, but I couldn't quite count them all. How many children? Ten children. Ten children. Because every now and then, every picture I saw, you had a few other ones mixed in there all the time. So you... <laughs> he'll fill you in but uh, he's not been here since I've been here so I know it's been 10 years since and uh, since he's been here the church has supported you since 95 is that right how long when did the church take you on for support in 2000 okay all right so about 15 years now and uh, it's a blessing to have him come through and uh, he's just going to give us an update and kind of let us know uh, what the Lord's been doing uh, with them and uh, we're looking forward to that this evening as well. And I uh, appreciate you being in church on Wednesday night. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful opportunity for us to gather together here again in the middle of the week. And thank you for the wonderful promises of God that we have to stand upon that we sang about tonight. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for Brother Porter, for your, his faithfulness to you. And for your using he and his family, Lord, there on the mission field in South Africa. And, Lord, we're excited to see just what you have done and what you're accomplishing there, uh, really in another part of the world from us. But, Lord, we're thankful that we have a part. We're thankful for faithful missionaries who serve you, Lord, and love you. And, Lord, I pray that you'll bless him as he speaks to us tonight. And, Lord, just give us a wonderful service together this evening. And I pray that we'll leave in a little bit saying... It sure was good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be seated if you will. Brother Porter, I want you to come. And uh, we're going to let you take this and um, grab one of those mics, if you will, and, and press it till you see the uh, green. Green means go. And then uh, you go ahead and do what you want, talk what you want, and then you're ready to go with that. Do you know how to start that? Yes, sir. I think it's All right. Church, I want to I want to thank you. I know I'm probably a new face to a lot of you, and um, I don't always understand why the Lord does that, but I don't, I don't know where to begin. I know there's a lot that needs to take place tonight, and um, I grew up in Chicago. My wife's from Fort Lauderdale. We met, got married in Colorado, got saved in Colorado, had three of our children in Colorado. Those three are married right now, and I got a grandson. Went into South Africa right after Nelson Mandela got into power. And the uh, Lord allowed us to be able to establish a church amongst the South African people. I was talking to a man today. The biggest issue in Africa is HIV AIDS. Just as everyone probably in this room before too long will have an issue with Alzheimer's in your family, personally, brother, sister, aunt, cousin, whoever. The, South, the, the African people literally have numerous members of the family that have already passed on because of AIDS. And I know we don't see that so much right here, but the gospel is good news only if you reach people in time. And we've heard that, but that is so much the truth. Uh, there was a young man that came through the hospital in South Africa. My wife was pregnant with number seven when we went in in 95. That little girl's up in heaven right now. And as a result of her going home, the Lord let us start a hospital ministry by which a man from Zimbabwe got saved. He was given a track. We would go in there and preach and sing and pass out, you know, and, and talk to people about the Lord. Real open provincial hospital. But he got saved, was a regular face. He lived with us for a number of years. He graduated our institute and told me in 2002, Pastor, I believe God wants me to go back up into Zimbabwe and reach my people. So 2002, I packed him, his wife, his little boy, and um, boy, there's so much to say about it. That's this Pastor Shadrach. You'll see him in the short video I've got, okay? Shad and Sarah Kumbiani. And I took them back in 2002. From two, three, four, five, six, and seven, I took a, one of my children up for a month, two times a year. 
And so that was my induction into Zimbabwe, crossing that border, the one of the most corrupt border posts in all of Africa. But when the work in South Africa became indigenous after 2008, I moved up into Zimbabwe. And it's, it's, it's a long story how we were able to get in there and God opened the doors for us to go in there. But I, I dare anyone here right now, if you Google Zimbabwe, you will not find an independent Baptist missionary in the country. There's no one in there. You got Malawi, Zambia, um, Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, Kenya, uh, Uganda. They've got hordes of missionaries. And I can't for the life of me realize why there's no, no one else in the country. Five Southern Baptists, three of them are women, and they ship in containers of clothes to be able to set up the national pastors that they train to be able to have a, a way of living by selling clothes from the States. Not our, 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 our stripe. But I'm back now, and there is a, um, a, a problem with our work permits. And I don't have time to tell you that right now, but I ask that you'd pray about that. There was an appeal that was filed last, last January 7th. It's still pending. In fact, I heard this week from some of our guys back in Zimbabwe that are actually calling down to immigrations. I know one of the immigrations officers, um, yeah, preacher, there's just too much for me to say. Um, let me show you the video. Um, if anyone would like to ask questions afterward, I'll hang out as long as you need me to. Okay, but so pray for our, our work permit. It's not a problem. We got permanent residents in South Africa, but working in Zimbabwe, having to go back and forth to the border every 30 days with a work visa or a holiday visa or a business visa is not real practical. It fills up your passport rather quick. Okay, so we're really seeking God's will. My wife right now is down in uh, Brooksville, Florida. Her folks are experiencing some health issues, and we didn't know that till September. And so it's really kind of put us in a way where we're really praying here, <laughs> seeing what God would have us do. This is my third time back in 20 years. We don't come back too often. But every time I come back, I see this country has changed dramatically. And I take my hat off to you guys because you're in a rough place right now. If anyone has any insight of what's going on in our country, oftentimes it takes a foreigner to see that. These coal miners, when they were underground, would put a canary in a cage, right? And if that canary was at the bottom of the off its perch at the bottom of the cage, those guys knew there was problems here. <laughs> they had to move. The canary's at the bottom of our country right now. Serious. And so we don't know how much time before the Lord comes back. The greatest thing is to give the gospel to people. And in, in Zimbabwe or Africa, you can sit down in an African home for 45 minutes. You can put your feet under the table. Not in the front room where you look at all their nice CDs, but in a place where they're, they're wanting to hear. Because of AIDS, they're open. They want to hear about Christ. The gospel is three, and this is what I tell them. The gospel is simple. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the message that people are missing here. And because of churches or other barriers in people's minds, they're kind of pushing you off, right? That's normally what happens. But listen, as people see what's going on in our country, I think God's going to soften their heart. But you've got to go on the offense. You've got to be able to confront them and talk to them or give them something. And I know and I trust that you're doing that. But our heart is back in Africa. It's not here. I don't want to settle here. We're running a double wide down there about five minutes from my wife's folks, walking distance, and God opened the door. It was a miracle for us to be able to do that. And so her mom and dad are both lost. His name is Ken Howe. Um, he has respiratory issues. And preacher, I won't take up any more of your time. You pray for the Porter family. We've got 10 children. I adopted a little African boy. I, I invested in Africa so much, I, ad I brought back a, a real life souvenir. And Matt was abandoned when he was born. He was three months when we took him home. Born in September, brought him home for Christmas. He's 18 now. And uh, Matt is a blessing, but he's having some problems. He had some problems with us up in Zimbabwe. He's in, a, uh, he's in an academy down in, in Alabama right now. And so I'd ask that you'd pray for him. His, his, his African name is Jabulo, and that means happy in Zulu. But up in Zimbabwe, listen, guys, where we're working in Zimbabwe, they know about it 600 miles away because of the fact that there's so much um, in Yangas or witch doctors, there's a lot of that in our area, and I have no idea. To this day, I can't tell you what happened with Matt. 
Would you pray for him? I've got a director and a boy's home saying, we can't keep him here. He's a major problem. And, and I don't mean to, to put a... I, I need your prayers in this matter, okay? That's just what's happening. That's just where we're at right now. So you pray for Matt, and uh, God would work on his heart. I think we're dealing with an un unregenerated teen, okay? And so pray for... We've got churches in Zimbabwe. Two of them don't have a pastor. I've got good men in our institute back there, but none of them are qualified to pastor. And so you pray for us. Let me show you the DVD. <laughs> And we'll get going. There we go. God was working on my heart. said it's time to do your part to take a stand for my name and here's a promise you can claim that as long as you're saving me you'll always be in my care so how You pray for us. We're going to be going back. I'm going to take my wife back over there for just under two months in, in June. We'll be back in August. And so you pray for us. Amen. Wow, that's great. That's great. That's hard to, hard to fit 15 years into about eight minutes, isn't it? That's, uh, that's tough to do. But thank you. Great, great job. And take time to see the display back there. Talk to him. Ask any questions you got. Let the Pat's kids get back out. They're, uh, they come in to, anytime we have a missionary, we want them to be in here to see the missionary. Amen. Amen. And uh, good group tonight there with the kids. Good. All right, take your songbook. Let's sing again together, shall we? Number 264. 264. He's able to deliver thee. 
Uh, tis the grandest theme through the age has sung. Tis the grandest theme, a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world there sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. Uh, he is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. On the last, it is the grandest theme. Let the tidings roll to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee, to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him, for as our God is able to deliver thee. All right. Now take your prayer guide, if you would. Anybody need one tonight? Anybody get in and didn't get one? We'll get one to you right away. Everybody good? Wonderful. Good job, fellas. And um, start on the back, uh, if you will. We can, or the middle, is that the back? Yeah, I think it is. The coming events. And uh, don't forget, now, tomorrow night, we got word. We uh, cannot go to the prison tomorrow night. They've got some kind of epiphany week uh, at the prison. And uh, all events, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, have been canceled for this special, whatever they've got going on there. So uh, we got notice on that. However... Uh, pray that tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, we're meeting with the assistant warden at the um, London uh, Correctional Facility, and we look forward to uh, talking with them, and that is to show them the RU material and uh, set up a time uh, when we can get in there. Um, we uh, The best time for some of the fellows are going to go is probably Sunday afternoon, and so they have to clear their uh, clear whatever is out it that is there and uh, make sure that they have time for us to come in and do that So pray for that meeting that that'll go. Well, that's 3 30 uh, Tomorrow afternoon. We will have are you here Friday night? Um, at 7 o'clock and uh, we had what we have six first time first time visitors last Friday uh, At are you had a great time had a couple that were saved and uh, it was a wonderful night So uh, God's doing good things there on Friday night. Saturday morning will be the men's breakfast, and uh, fellas, make sure you sign up, all right? And uh, if you show up and you didn't sign up, you will be the last one to go through the line. If there's anything left, you'll get it, all right? And uh, gotta, I, I look at that list when we go to the store to buy the, the food for uh, the breakfast, so uh, sign up, okay? And uh, we'll make sure we'll buy plenty for everybody to have on Saturday morning. It'll be a great time uh, come Saturday. Uh, 8.15 for that, the sign-up sheet's down. Uh, in the foyer. Of course, our soul winning and bus visitation uh, will be Saturday at 10, as usual, right here in the auditorium. And uh, I'll say more about the bus. You saw the bus out back, and uh, I'll say more about that in just a few minutes and uh, tell you what the what situation is on the bus. And then, ladies, your high tea is uh, May 2nd, 11.30 uh, a.m., and uh, that's kind of the mother-daughter uh, thing this uh, this year, and uh, it's going to be right here in this auditorium. Going to be a very special time. Uh, you don't want to miss that. It's going to be a good a good program planned and a good speaker, and uh, just a wonderful time of fellowship with the ladies uh, and mother daughters here at the church. All right. Speaking of mother daughters, uh, Linderman's got a new granddaughter today, right? Congratulations! Wonderful. It's great. And uh, got any details for us? Adeline. All right, very good, and everybody's doing great? Praise the Lord. Good, good, great, wonderful. All right, that's good news. Okay, um, on the inside, if you, the praise reports, we praise the Lord. We had a good Thursday night last week at the prison, down again a little bit in attendance, and uh, we're checking into that, but we did add four that received Christ as their Savior, and uh, the 30, total of 3682 received on the bus, and uh, that's tremendous, and that's why um, they... Uh, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll just, just enough to tell you that we sent uh, Brother Taylor and Brother Campbell out to get the bus, and I think they left around 3.15 3 or 3.30 uh, Tuesday morning, 
uh, head out to Peru, Illinois. It's uh, roughly 415, 420 miles from here. And uh, they got there, looked over buses, drove buses, and then got the, picked the one that the uh, Lord had for us. And uh, they, then they got in it and started driving home. And they drove all the way back here and got in about, I think, 2.30 in the morning or so uh, back here into Grove City. So uh, almost 24 hours. Uh, and I, uh, you know, some of you young people, you think, boy, pulling 24 hours, that'd be cool. Not so cool when you're past 60, you know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> amen, brothers. But uh, they're both in church tonight. How about that? And uh, but that's uh, that's a lot of driving and uh, a long day. And I uh, appreciate you fellows doing that. Thank you. And uh, I texted Bill when he said he te- sent me a text. It must have been about nine o'clock. Said, well, we're in Indianapolis. He said, the bus is running so good, we may take her a few times around the track. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just said, you guys are crazy, man. You're crazy. And uh, that's nuts. But uh, uh, all, it's wonderful. So uh, praise the Lord for that. And again, I'll fill you on the bus in just a few minutes right before the offering, okay, and tell you what, what's going on with that. Continue to pray for the different church ministries. Uh, pray for the health list here, if you would. Uh, especially Heather's grandmother there, Rose, just a, just a day-by-day situation. So uh, keep praying for her uh, and for the family. Uh, appreciate you doing that. Um, and then, of course, the uh, uh, praying for these folks in authority and, of course, the cancer list, these battling cancer, uh, those on our salvation list. And uh, jot down, was it Ken Howe, your mother's father or your wife's father? And uh, pray for him, for his salvation. And then put Matt on there as well, all right? And uh, let's put them and let's pray for them, uh, for their salvation as well, all right? And then, of course, those serving in our military and then our missionaries. And uh, we were going to uh, highlight Brother Booth this evening, but I think we'll, uh, we'll just make sure that we pray for Brother Porter uh, this evening and God's work there, and uh, especially Zimbabwe, and that the Lord will work out these legal uh, snafus that are there right now and uh it's not not unusual we're here we hear things like this all around the world where they're really tightening up um we had some folks who are trying to get into india and uh they're really giving them a hard time uh it's really getting detailed and specific about what are you going to be doing here you know what i mean and if anything to do with jesus christ they don't want you to come in and uh so it's uh we got to pray for pray for that situation all right um, and then also, I want to remind you, um, add uh, Chris Dutton on the list. Most of you heard Brother Dutton uh, Sunday evening uh, preach for you. It's his, it's his son, and uh, he's going to have back surgery April 30th, all right, uh, 42 years of age. And kind of surgery where they don't, they don't go through the back, they go through the neck to get to the back. And uh, so pray for him uh, for that surgery coming up on April 30th. That's Chris Dutton. All right. And then uh, Sally Spargro is going to be moving. Uh, Sally is going to be actually moving to Florida. I know. I know. Tough job, but somebody's got to do it, you know. Uh, had a great, that's a great opportunity to, to go there, and uh, I think a good situation, and I think it's what the Lord would have. Uh, but she's selling some things, and uh, she, if you're interested and you want to see what she has or what, what's available, talk to her after the service. Uh, she's off tomorrow. She'll be at, her, be at her apartment, so feel free to go by and take a look at what she has, and if it's something you can use, I'm sure she's glad to. She's got a downsize. Uh, the place she's going, I think, is already furnished, isn't it, or for the most part, so she can't take a lot of her things, and so... Uh, help her out there if you can maybe something you need and it'll work out you need it and she needs it and it'll work out for everybody okay and uh, that'll be a good thing all right well listen let's bow and we'll just have a short prayer this evening and I'll lead us in prayer as we pray for these needs tonight and uh, then we'll move on with the service all right let's bow together shall we heavenly father we bow before you now this evening we thank you lord for the wonderful report tonight from brother porter Lord, I thank you so much for just uh, in a few short minutes uh, the lives that have been reached, the, the souls saved and baptized, churches established, uh, your work going forward. 
uh, Lord, so, so many, many miles away from here. But Lord, thank you that you're doing a great work there through the porters. And Father, I'm praying for this Zimbabwe transition. Uh, there seems to be a holdup with uh, the visas, the paperwork, the, and Lord, whatever it is, Lord, the, the heart of the king is in your hands, and you can turn that heart. And we're praying you'll turn the heart of these officials, and whoever it is, wherever the holdup is, Lord, cause it to, to break through and give them their, their permanent visa, the, uh, whatever is needed, Lord, to keep them there, to be able to minister there, to be able to establish a, a, a lighthouse for Christ there in Zimbabwe. Lord, we trust you for that. We do pray for Mrs. Porter's father and mother. Lord, their health is not good. And uh, Lord, of course, none of us know the day or the hour when, when we'll go to meet you. But Lord, I pray that they'll come to faith in Christ before it's eternally too late. Lord, use this time as she ministers to them and loves them for them to see Christ in her life. And I pray that they'll come to know him as their Savior. And Lord, I pray for Matt, that you'll touch his heart. Lord, as uh, Brother Porter told us, it's, it just may be a matter he needs to be born again. Lord, I pray that his heart changes, his behavior will change. And I pray, God, that you'll touch his heart. Put somebody in his life who he'll listen to, who he'll, he'll, he'll have his ear. And Lord, it'll, those words that he speaks will sink down in his heart. And Lord, save this young man and change his life for your honor and glory. Lord, we do thank you for your provision for our bus. Thank you, Lord, for the many in this room that gave sacrificially for us to get that bus here. Now, Lord, help us to get the, the work done on it, to be able to uh, get it ready for inspection and ready to get onto the road that we can run that bus and fill it up with boys and girls and men and women and teenagers that need to hear the gospel and need to be in church. And Father, we pray that you'll help all that to, to come to pass as well, and you'll continue to meet that need. Pray for our country fair day coming up, that, Lord, you'll provide, and thank you, Lord, for the help that came in already this week, and we pray you'll continue to meet those needs. And, uh, Father, we want to be a blessing to our community. We want to let folks know that we love them, and there's a God in heaven that loves them, and sent his son to die for them. And I pray we'll have uh, souls to be saved on that day, and, Lord, uh, that you'll touch the hearts of people uh, who come under the influence of our fair that day. And uh, continue to bless the flyers as we begin to pass those out, that, Lord, you'll touch the hearts of people that receive them. And I pray that you'll give us many opportunities to give the gospel during these next few weeks. Lord, we, we do love you this evening, and we thank you for the privilege that's ours to pray. I do lift up the other lost on the list here, Lord, and those battling cancer and the different categories that... We pray for, and I pray, God, that you would meet uh, the need in each situation. You're the God who hears prayer. You're the God who answers prayer, and we thank you for that. And, Lord, we lift these requests up to you, and we ask you to work and to answer uh, just exactly as you would see fit and what you would believe would be the best way to answer and to work in people's lives. Now, Lord, bless the remainder of our service here tonight. Now, Lord, open our understanding. Open our eyes that we could build wondrous things out of your law as we study the word together. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Take your songbook. Let's sing again together, all right? Turn over to 243. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Let's stand together to sing it. All of us standing, it's 243. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Of things that are higher, things that are nobler. Sigh, I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great as highest. I will come to thee. Greet each other. We'll come back and we'll sing the last stanza together.
hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great as highest, I will come to thee. On the last stanza now together. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Foes may beset me still, will I enter and sing it now? I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, you may be seated. Good singing tonight. Ushers come, and we're ready to get the offering tonight. Now, here's what uh, took place with our bus. The, um, the, the bus he had, the bus you see out there, was uh, one of the only full-size buses they had there. Is that correct, Don? They had a, like a handicap bus there that we could add seats in. But even with adding seats in, it was only going to seat, what did you say, Brother Taylor, 36, 38, something like that? Somewhere in the 30s, and that's not, that's not what we're looking for. We want a full-size uh, pack of men bus, all right? And so the, here's the thing, though. This particular bus, he wanted $4,400 for. I told him, we're not paying $4,400. I said, we don't have $4,400. I told him, we're gonna pay, we can pay $3,500. And uh, the fellow is a great guy. He's, uh, he's a younger man. He's, uh, he, they were, Brother Taylor was guessing, you know, if he may be 30. Uh, he's a young man. In fact, this is the last year he's doing this. He uh, is actually taking a church. He's going to pastor. Uh, he's a good, good, good fellow. And uh, he, uh, as a, believe him, and he's honest, and he said he, he really has paid, he paid 4400 for it. He's going to take, he would lose 900 on it if he, Gave it to us 3500 but here's what he said he'd do. He said, I'm going to give you guys the bus. He, he didn't take any money for it. He said, you drive it back to Ohio. See how you like it. See if it drives good. You get it back there, and you're happy with it, and you want it. He said, if you just take a love offering for me, and whatever it is you get, I'll be happy with. And he gave it to us, and, and then, we, then he said, then you send me the check, and whatever the love offering is, and it'll all be done. We have the title. Gave him the title, gave us everything, and didn't take anything. And uh, so here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going we're gonna to take a love offering for him, okay, and um, designate that just as bus, okay, with a bus on it. That way we know that's uh, what it's going to go towards because also I want us to take an offering for Brother Porter, all right? I just want to be a blessing to him. Uh, I didn't it just great to be able to meet him and uh, it's always good when our missionaries can stop by and see us and uh, we're delighted he came tonight and so I'd like to I'd like to give him something for his trip here uh, to help him on his way he's got mouths to feed and uh, family to take care of and uh, we want to try to be a blessing to him as well all right so uh, we'll uh, if it's just loosen the plate or you would designate it you can divide up a check if you want and uh, we'll make sure they get it whatever however you want to do that um, and appreciate your giving to this, to both these needs, all right? But I thought it was really, really great uh, of that fellow, the way he handled the bus. And it's a 2002, and uh, it only has 121,000 miles on it, which is pretty low for a bus. And uh, from what these guys said, it drove like a charm uh, driving here from Illinois. So it's, uh, it's not ready to go yet. We can't just put it on the road until we get some things done to it and the, they have to ins give an inspection to it and give us a sticker and we have to get it tagged and get the title and all that good stuff so uh, we're, we're going to jump on that right away the, the goal, it won't be ready for this Sunday the 26th, but the goal is we can run that bus May 3rd uh, we'd like to run it May 3rd, May 10th and then have it ready for the country fair weekend and give them three weeks to get things going All right, he had 18 on that little bus Sunday so and, uh, and that was with some adults picking up some other people. I don't know, they'd had even more. Uh, so I think uh, right away, I think I'm expecting to see oh, anywhere from 20 to 30 on that bus right off the bat. So uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing uh, on the giving 
of this evening. Brother Wallace, I'd like you to pray for me. Father, we do thank you again for this opportunity we have to give. And Lord, I just ask that you would bless every penny toward uh, the use of it. And Lord, just uh, give us a, a spirit tonight of, of uh, giving with a free heart, giving with a glad heart. Lord, then bless the, the teaching of your word. Bless Brother Porter, Lord, as he goes uh, on his way. And Lord, just uh, let him know uh, every day that we're, we uh, think about him, we pray for him, we pray for his family, we pray for his uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law, Lord, and help them, put your hand upon them, Lord, and, uh, save their souls, and uh, Lord, help Matthew. And Lord, we'll just give you all the praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your Bible this evening, Matthew chapter 5, if you would please. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse number 9, if you look there, please. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight. And Lord, as we look once again into your word, I pray that you would open understanding, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to our church this evening, and that, Father, we would rightly divide the word of truth, and that we would listen this evening, not with the idea just to be enlightened or to increase knowledge, but that we would listen so we could live the Bible we learn. And we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, I pray you, Holy Spirit of God, do your work in our midst this evening as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you tonight about the gospel. We've been focusing on the gospel in the month of April. And uh, tonight I want to talk about the gospel and the Christian life, and particularly uh, the gospel and how you can enjoy being a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I don't think you ought to endure being a Christian. I think you ought to enjoy being a Christian. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, and by the way, the Bible talks about how when we love God, His commandments are not grievous. Uh, it's not hard. He's not a hard taskmaster. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonder, it's, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. And, uh, and we ought to enjoy serving Christ. And the way you can do it, and this is, most of you know, blessed here, these, these words blessed, 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 really means happy are you. And, and, and the Lord is telling us how we can enjoy being His follower and enjoy being a Christian. And 
two of the ways he says we can do that are listed in these verses that we're looking at this evening. And it's really interesting. He said two of the ways that you can enjoy the Christian life is, number one, eliminate strife. And number two, you endure spite. You eliminate strife and you endure spite. In other words, he says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. A peacemaker tries to eliminate strife. There's a great need for peacemakers today, not only in our nation, but in our churches and in our homes. Well, why is that, Pastor? Because there's, there, there's, there seems to be a lot of troublemakers. When there's troublemakers, there needs to be peacemakers. Troublemakers counterbalance uh, the peacemakers, I guess. You know, some people just seem to have in their nature, they always want to have trouble going on. They always, we always, we call them drama people. They always got to have some kind of drama in their life. And they always got to be at odds with somebody or something or something going on. Uh, it just ha seems like it has to be that way or they're not very happy, uh, not very content. And, but Jesus never said to be a troublemaker. He said, be a peacemaker. In fact, later in the gospel or in, in the epistles, Paul said, follow peace with all men and, and the things that make for peace. And so we're to try to be the peacemaker. You know, the first sin in the Bible separated man from God. The second sin in the Bible separated man from man. Cain killing Abel. Listen, so you find out that the, the first sin caused trouble between God and man. The second sin was man causing trouble with his fellow man. And it's interesting. So the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, our mind, our strength. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. It goes together, doesn't it? And if you don't get number one right, you'll never get number two right. That's our problem in America. We're trying to get everybody to love each other, but we tell them you don't have to love God. Well, my friend, if you don't love God, you're never going to love one another. It won't work. It won't work. It'll be impossible. But Jesus came as the Prince of Peace to set man at peace with God. He came to be a peacemaker. <laughs> now, he did it through the blood of his cross. And he, and he now made it possible for us who were alienated and away from God to be at peace with God because of what he did on the cross. But now that I'm a child of God and I've received Christ my Savior and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, now I should, I should work at being a peacemaker in my world, a peacemaker in my church, a peacemaker in my home, not a troublemaker. All right? Not someone who's trying to stir up strife and stir up tension or provide, provide drama, but one that tries to cure that. Now, how do I become a peacemaker? Well, notice what the, the Scriptures say. Number one, I have to take a new look at me. I have to take a new look at me. You know what the Bible talks about? Whenever there's envying and strife, then there's always confusion and every, every evil work. But there's always pride. Pride's always present whenever there's contention. And pride always comes. Contention simply means somebody wants superiority. Somebody wants the attention. Somebody wants it, the, the focus. Somebody wants, and, and they're upset when someone else gets it and they don't. Okay? That's pride. And, and so we have to look at ourselves. Troublemakers are always exceeding selfish. How is this going to affect me? What will happen to me? What's in it for me? Is this fair to me? What about my rights? What about my just due? It's all about me, 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 me. Huh? Paul said, hey, listen, it's a great day when you get free from yourself. And, and you, listen, peacemakers don't think little of themselves. Peacemakers don't think of themselves at all. Peacemakers don't think of themselves at all. Peacemakers are active. Peacemakers take charge, but not for selfish purposes, for the purpose of doing what is right in the sight of God. That makes for peace. Peacemakers are not touchy. They're not defensive. They're not sensitive. I hope I'm, I hope, I hope I'm honest when I make this statement. I've made this statement to people. 
Sometimes people come and they say, Brother Porter, now, preacher, he said, I hope I don't offend you. And I tell them, you can't offend me. I hope I, hope I mean that. But, but I, I should not. Great, the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Should not be anything that could offend them. Especially if you are trying to tell the truth, and you're trying to be a help. So don't be sensitive. Don't be defensive. Remember what Jesus said? He that loveth his life shall lose it. Lose it. Why? If you're loving you, you're going to lose. You're going to lose that. Because it's talking about loving yourself and living for yourself. I like the story of Abraham Lincoln who was walking down the road with his two boys and they're fussing and having a fit and somebody passing by said, looks like your boys are having a pretty rough day. What seems to be the problem? And Abraham Lincoln said, it's the same thing that's wrong with the rest of the world. I've got three walnuts and each boy wants two. That's true. How about making an emancipation proclamation to be free from yourself? No wonder Paul said, I die daily. Crucify the flesh, my desires, what I want, what I think, what I feel. See, when you get saved, it's no longer what I want, what I think, and what I feel. It's what God wants, what God thinks, and what God feels. It's not a matter of what, what, I, what I think is good. And usually when, you, when we're selfish is we get on that thing, and, well, I don't see what's so bad about it, or I don't think this is so wrong. Well, it doesn't matter what I think or what I feel. What does God say? What does God say? We have to get a new look at our self. Number two, we have to take a new look at the many. At the many. What's that mean? I need to see others the way Christ sees them. I'm looking at myself, but I have to look at the many. Sometimes, you ever, you ever look at somebody and say, man, how can they be that way? You ever done that? How can, they, how can they behave that way? Or how can they act that way? Or why did they do that? Can I tell you why they're doing that? Because they're human. <laughs> because, because we're all sinful creatures. That's why. And, and someone said, the best of men are still men at best. And that's true. And, and, and I want to help some of you tonight who may be newer Christians. And even if you're not a new Christian, it may be something good that you can remember. And as you continue on in your Christian life, there'll come a time when if you're, if you're not careful, you'll be, you'll be highly disappointed. I hope you don't get disillusioned. Uh, to use a familiar term of today, I guess you can be blown away with the behavior of people. And by the way, the behavior of Christians. And then sometimes that can be pretty dis disillusioning to a new believer. You'll be just amazed sometimes at what Christians do. But, uh, I mean, they'll fail you. They'll let you down. They won't keep their word. Uh, but don't be surprised. They're, listen, don't, don't go looking for it, but understand that that even Christians are sinners too. And, and, and as much as uh, we don't want to, sometimes we don't want to do that, sometimes people are still, though they're saved, they're still walking after the flesh. They're not walking after the Spirit. And you have to understand that. Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. And there are those who are the enemies of the cross. And, and you have to be ready for that and be prepared for that. Maybe they're the victim of self, and they're living selfishly, and that's going to cause a problem. That'll be a trouble-causing venture. Or maybe they're a victim of Satan, but either way, if you're going to be a peacemaker, you have to view them the way Jesus would see them. Lord, help me see them the way you would. 
Help me to understand them the way you would. If I'm going to be a peacemaker, I have to have a new look at me. If I'm going to be a peacemaker, I have a new look at, at the many. And then if I'm going to be a peacemaker, I have to have a new look at the multitudes. You see, the peacemaker has a biblical worldview. They see the world through the eyes of the Bible. That, that God is to be glorified. The gospel has to be spread. The gospel has to go to every creature. And I want to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody ought, to, everybody ought to hear before it's too late. The saddest to me, the cry in hell, is not the ones who had opportunity to be saved and didn't. It's the one who find themselves in hell and no one ever told them. We never got the gospel to them. We were, we were building big buildings. We had, we, were, we had big budgets. We had nice facilities. And we let the world go to hell. Shame on us. Did I, I don't know if I mentioned to you or not, a, a church that uh, Andy and Nikki were in on, down in, when they went on vacation, and they attended a church. They had, uh, I think, about, they, they thought about maybe 400 on a Sunday morning. They put the print in the bulletin, like a lot of churches do, you know, the offering and what it was going to do. The week before that, they had a $12,500 offering, pretty healthy offering. And they break down what it goes for, and it was a big chunk went for a building payment that they had. That retirement went for some. And then they saw the line for missions. You know what the missions giving was from that previous week? $60. Missions. They went back to church on Sunday night, and there she said that they, she counted there might have been 80 people there on Sunday night. 400 on Sunday morning. Oh, but we got, look at our facilities. Look how, look at our beautiful buildings. But, but we're, we're, we're losing sight of the main thing. The main thing is people are dying going to hell. What are we doing to get the gospel to them? Let's keep the main thing the main thing. When it comes to the being the peacemaker, you have to remember this, whether, whether I have my rights or, or not have my rights or anything like that, what does that really matter in the light of eternity? When you're about ready to get all bent out of shape over what somebody says to you or whether somebody did or didn't do something for you, can we just step back and say, now wait a minute. What will this matter in eternity? Will this really impact things when I get to heaven? Or is this something that, that the devil would like me to go chase this rabbit? Because while I'm consumed with this, I'm not telling anybody about Jesus. I'm not giving anybody the gospel. Because I'm all consumed about this person and talking to everybody what I can about this person. Troublemakers are not soul winners. Is this on? Troublemakers are not soul winners. Peacemakers are. How can I practically apply this? How can I, how can I do that? How can I give you a couple practical things? If you want to be a peacemaker and you want to have the right world view, number one, you learn to control your speaking. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James 1.19. Know, know when you ought to open your mouth, and more importantly, know when you ought not to. The Bible says something about a fool uttereth what? All is mine. How many times do you hear people say, well, if I think it, I just say it. Well, you just called yourself a fool, according to the Bible. You don't say everything you think. And by the way, let me just, just so you know also, the devil doesn't read your mind. The devil is not omniscient. He, he doesn't know your thoughts. But you know, why, you know why he gets, you say, boy, he gets on me so much. You know why? Because you run this too much. You, you, you verbalize what you're thinking, and he hears it. And then he attacks you on that. And you think, boy, he must have been reading my mind. No, he was listening to your mouth. Two ears, 
one mouth, do the math, okay? Listen twice as much as you speak. To a large degree, the difference between a peacemaker and a troublemaker is whether they've learned to control the tongue. Now, let me, let me on the heels of that, say none of us can control the tongue. You read James chapter 3. You know what it says? The tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And, and we can't control it ourselves. Well, if no man can tame it, how do I get, how do I get my tongue tamed? It has to be the Holy Spirit. It has to be God. It can't be me. But now listen, it's not, it, the problem isn't that tongue because it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. The old, the old timer said it's what's down in the well that comes up in the bucket. So I, the, the real problem is God's not controlling my heart. I need the Spirit of God to take control in my heart. And if He's in control of my heart, It'll guard my mouth. My mouth will speak right things. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's why you control the mouth, but you're, think, you're speaking, but you also learn to control your thinking. In Philippians, Paul reminds us we're to have the mind of Christ. We're to have the mind of Christ. Proverbs tells us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Thinking determines living. What I said about the fellow at the prison, where he talked about how the, we found that the, the, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Find that they're finding out if we don't get to their heart, we don't change their behavior. And he's right. Listen, my friend, if you, don't, if you don't allow God to get to your heart, you'll never change your behavior. You'll, that's where you'll try to live the Christian life. You'll try to conform to everybody's rules or standards without it ever God ever doing anything in your heart. And you know what? Eventually, you're going to get frustrated. You're going you're gonna to get uh, uh, angry. You're going to feel like it's not worth it. What am I doing this for? And you'll quit. You'll give up. Because God never intended for you to do it in your own strength. You have the mind of Christ. Someone said this, and I think it's true. Troublemakers live according to their feelings. Peacemake, peacemakers live according to their thinking. You live according to your feelings, so you do live according to your thinking. There is a choice. There is a choice. And the truth of the matter is, there's nothing wrong with feelings, but you have to, as we talked about Sunday morning, they have to come in the right order. When it comes to salvation, remember, we talked about you have to have the facts, and then the faith, and then the feeling. Don't, 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 you, you can't reverse that order and look for a feeling first. No, the facts, the faith, and then the feeling. And listen, that's still true after you're saved. Facts and your faith in the facts of the Word of God. And if you'll do that, the feeling will come. The feeling will come, but you do what's right. Second Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. You want to look there real quick? Second Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. These are such good verses, and I want you to see them. Second Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. Are you all right? Everybody okay? Now, Paul is talking to the church here at Corinth, and by the way, he's, he, he's, he's responding to some people who were basically criticizing him, all right? And he's, he's responding by saying that uh, we, wa we walk in the flesh, verse 3. We do not war after the flesh. Now, it's interesting. Verse 4 is in parentheses. What is parentheses in the Bible? It's a personal note from the author to the reader. It's a personal note from God to us, okay? And what does God say? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. When that, that, that phrase against the knowledge of God is what we know to be true about God. Any thought that goes against what we know to be true about God. What are you supposed to do? Cast it out. Don't dwell on it. I don't, I, you don't keep that in your mind. And bring in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's, that's how you change your thinking. You change your thinking by when the, any imagination that exalts itself against what you know to be true about God, you know what you do? You, you say, no, that's done. I'm not thinking about that. You cast it out. Cast it down. Throw it out. Get rid of it. Most of the time in James when it talks about how we're lured, we're, 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 we're uh, tempted to, be, to go off the path and lured, it, the, the word really there is, uh, is it, it, we frame it in our mind. We keep it, and we think about it, and we're dwelling on it, and when pretty soon we're trying to figure out how it can be done. Because we didn't get rid of it when that thought came in our mind. Nobody, I, listen, we use that term, somebody fell into sin. That's generally not the case. We funk it, we dwelled on it, until we figured a way to do it. And we did. And then reason, as soon as that thought comes in, cast it out. Cast it out. Bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. The, the result of wrong living is stinking thinking. You're thinking on the wrong things. When the Bible says, love your enemies, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. All right? The promise is, in Matthew chapter 5, when you're peacemaker, you'll be called the children of God. The children of God. We said this the other day about genes. You know, children, children are like their parents. I mean, you, we were talking to somebody in our relatives down at the wedding on Sunday, you know, and they were talking about one of their, some of their children. Um, our one nephew has four children. And they were saying, well, I'm not sure who this one looks like, who this one, well, I think this one from the eyes up looks like her dad, but from the ear down looks like her mom. And, you know, they're trying to figure out, but you know what, it, mom or dad's in there because that's their children. If you're a child of God, you need to take on the characteristics of your father. And you, we should. When you... When you return kindness for somebody's anger, when you return tenderness for somebody's bitterness, you, you, you make an impression on them because that's what Jesus would do. That's how Jesus would respond. You know, somebody may just look at you and say, wow, you must be a Christian. But it's the way you handle things when you're not treated well. Take a new look at me, get rid of the selfishness. Take a look at the many and see them through God's eyes. Take a look at the multitude and realize what's really important. Learn to control your thinking and your speaking, and you can eliminate strife in your life. You can be a peacemaker. But now he's going to talk about spite. Notice verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets. Wow. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You say, yeah, God bless them. Huh? It's easy to say that, isn't it? Then Jesus turned and said, and blessed are you when men are going to revile you and persecute you and say all men are against you falsely. Ooh, now that's different. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. He's, he's, 
congratulating them. And as I look at this, you know, you ask yourself, have I ever been persecuted? Have I truly been persecuted? And by the way, if not, why not? And if I have been, how did I respond? Did I rejoice? Did I find motivation in that? Or did the devil get his way? Did I succumb to the temptation to become discouraged or clam up and not say anything? Or did I want to retaliate, get vengeful, resentful? It's a very searching beatitude, isn't it? You know, the Bible says a lot about persecution. Matthew 10, verse 17, Beware of men, they'll deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Matthew 24, 9, They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. 2 Timothy 3, 11 and 12, talking about in the last days perilous times will come. And, and I'm sorry, Paul is talking about his journeys and his missionary trips, and he talks about persecutions and afflictions which came to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Lister is where he was stoned and left for dead. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, now listen, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, if you are of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute, also persecute you. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. 1 John 3, verse 13, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. You understand, throughout the history of the Christian church, there's always been persecution. It began with Christ and His sufferings. It continued with the apostles, the disciples, and then continued on in the early church. There were persecutions in, from A.D. 100 to 300 where Christians from all over the known world under the Roman Empire were thrown to the lion. Nero had Christians wrapped in animal skins and smeared their bloody scent so they'd be attacked even more ferocious, ferociously by the animals. He lit his garden at night with Christians wearing robes dipped in wax. Fox's Book of Martyrs will tell you about those who were pulled apart on the rack, boiled in oil, flayed alive, or roasted on a gridiron. Others that are too gruesome to talk about. Over that period of 300 years, they estimate 2 to 4 million believers lost their lives. During the Dark Ages, an estimated 50 million Christians died for their faith. By the way, many of them protesting the practices and the beliefs of the Catholic Church. When communists seized China, it was about one million Christians that were slaughtered. Yet it's amazing, there's still Christians in China today. House churches, thriving. I was speaking to someone not long ago, and they said they, they believe that there's, there's many reports coming out that there's, there's, there's probably well over a million Christians in Iran. That Muslim stronghold, yet there's believers there. even in the face of death if they get caught. Richard Wormbrand, some of you may know that name. He's a good example of persecution under communism. Richard Wormbrand is the founder of the uh, paper, The Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you get that and look at that. This man, when the communists took Romania, he was held underground in complete darkness for three years. 
They tried to brainwash him with communist and anti-Christian propaganda. He was beaten and tortured regularly. He tells of being force-fed salt and then not given any water for hours. In a mockery of the Lord's Supper, they made him eat his own feces, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. They do likewise with his urine. Several years ago, when back when communism was still in control in the Soviet Union, it is, it is said, and I don't know if this is true, but it is said that a group of Christians were meeting behind closed doors in an underground church, secret meeting, a secret church service, as often went on behind the Iron Curtain. Suddenly the doors burst open and soldiers appeared with their submachine guns, and they shouted to all those who are willing to renounce Jesus Christ, you have five minutes to leave. Everyone else who remains will be shot. Of course, every Christian in the place began to search their heart and ask themselves, am I willing to die for Christ now, today? A few got up and left. Quietly, they left with heads bowed low. But most of the people stayed. As the last one got up and shuffled out the back door, the soldier again shot his gun in the air and repeated, anyone else? No one else moved, and so the soldiers locked the doors, turned toward the people, and laid down their guns and said, brothers and sisters, we are Christians also, but we didn't want to worship the Lord with anyone not willing to die for now that the half-hearted are gone, let's have a church service. When you read the account of the New Testament church, the persecution only caused them to grow. The persecution only caused them to scatter. What was designed to hurt the church actually helped the church because it became a serious and a separated and a sold-out church. It was Tertullian who said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We're seeing it today, are we not? There are, there are Christians every single day being martyred for Jesus Christ. In fact, I was, uh, Mrs. Parrish was telling me today, Brenda was telling me about the group. Where were those folks killed at, Brenda? Was it Yemen? And she said the other believers were actually rejoicing for them. But that's what Matthew says they were supposed to do. Rejoice. And by the way, when the apostles left, they, they were rejoicing. They counted themselves worthy to suffer persecution for Jesus' sake. And these Christians, they were, they, they were gladly, they were, they were happy to give their lives for Jesus Christ. With the rise of the Islam, the barbarous torture and killing of believers. I read this week where there's millions imprisoned, Christians imprisoned in more than a hundred countries in the world. We don't we don't even hear about it. We don't we that doesn't make that's not newsworthy to our news media. And so we do not know what goes on. But it may not be long till it comes to our shore. And it will, it will separate the wholehearted from the half-hearted. It will separate the wheat from the chaff. But the but listen. They'll be, we'll have stronger churches because of it. God's work will go forward. Now you may not face persecution like that, but maybe you faced persecution of losing your job because you took a stand for something. Maybe uh, we're dismissed because you took a stand and said, I won't work on the Lord's day. Or maybe you were denied advancement in your workplace or you just endured some 
some sneering or some remarks because you're the Christian. They whisper, especially if they see you reading your Bible on break. We think we're, we have it hard if somebody slams a door in our face or doesn't want to listen to us. But it's not important how we're persecuted, but that we're persecuted. And by the way, that we're persecuted for doing what is right. Don't, don't go do something stupid and then think, well, I'm being persecuted. Okay? You, you make sure you're doing it for what's right. And then how do I respond to it? Abel was righteous. Cain was wicked. Cain killed Abel. David was a man after God's own heart. But he had to dodge the spear of Saul a couple times. He had to dodge the armies of Saul from killing him. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself, one of the purest men in all the kingdom, but he got thrown in the den of lions. Listen, uh, Christians have always been persecuted. John the Baptist, there's never been a greater than John the Baptist. Those are Jesus' words. John got beheaded for the truth. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to have these people walk up to John and say, you know what, John, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What are you talking about? All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not might suffer. Not may suffer. Shall suffer persecution. So the question you might ask would be, not why do the righteous suffer, but has I, have I as a Christian suffered? For Jesus Christ. I think, unfortunately, for most of us American Christians, the answer would be no. And if they do, when the time comes and we do face that persecution, how will we respond? How do you respond to somebody? Will we retaliate? Jesus said, no, you don't retaliate. What do you do? Rejoice. Rejoice. And they departed, Acts 5.41, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I'm afraid we have a Christianity today where, where so many Christians... They, wanna, they, they, they don't want to be different, don't want to look different in the world, don't want to act different from the world, don't want to talk different from the world. They, they want to they be cool, and they want everybody to think that they're, they're cool Christians. And, 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 and if it comes down to really suffering for Christ, suffering and being persecuted for His name's sake, I'm not sure they're going to stand up to it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Would you go there, please? Are you all right? We're almost done. I can see the lights, the landing lights on the runway. 2 Corinthians 4. These are great verses. Verse number 16 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. There's a great reward for living your faith out. Over in Romans, he said essentially the same things when he said that 
I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul was persecuted, and often for just telling the truth, telling people what, what God has said. But you know, people need to hear the truth. If I've got cancer, I don't want the doctor just telling me to take two aspirin and come see him in a month. I want you to tell me the truth. I want to know. And we tell the truth, and we see how they respond. That's why the Bible says we're the light of the world. What does the light do? The light exposes darkness. And often people who are in darkness, they don't like the light. But there's always some that will be attracted to the light. They've been in darkness long enough. They don't like the darkness, and they're ready to see some light. And we shine the light for them. Then he says, we're also the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. It can. And sometimes, that's why sometimes you're irritating to some people. But salt also will create a thirst, won't it? That's what we ought to be doing. Listen, and you don't create a thirst in anybody when, when you're no different than they are. The attraction is always in the difference. Not in being just like everybody else. We were talking recently to some of my wife and I, and they're saying that um, we we're talking about how the, the 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 dress just isn't any different anymore for believers. And and you ought to you ought to look different. And they said, Yeah, but you look different then then you won't reach as many people for Christ. No, that's a lie of the devil. That's not true. You, 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 if, if, you're just, if there's no difference, then there's no attraction. Somebody will look at you sometimes and say, man, what? you're different. Yeah, we're, the Bible says we're peculiar people. We belong to God. We march to the beat of a different leader than what they do. And they ought to see that. We approach the end of the world and we get closer to that time of the tribulation period the Bible talks about. We're going to face some persecution, I believe. We're already, we're getting there in America. We're already hearing, you know, Christians be described as radical, right wing, those fundamentalists, extremists. And you'll find out that sometimes when they talk about those Islamic who are, who are carrying out terrorist attacks, they use the same adjectives for them that they're using on believers. It's coming. But I wonder if those soldiers came into the room tonight with their guns and made that same statement here at Bible Baptist Church, would you stay or would you leave? Um, you may sit here and say, I don't know what I'd do, Pastor. I can, I can tell you what you'd do. You know why? I, could, I can tell you if you'd stay and die for him or whether you'd leave and walk out the door. Say, so how can I know that? Here's what I think you can know that. Are you living for him now? If you're not living for him now, you won't die for him. You'll walk out the door. That's why millions of people risk their lives worldwide to go to a church service. They they will oftentimes take uh, several hours just to just to arrive at church because they go just two at a time or one at a time until uh, about four or five hours later they finally are all there, and then they'll have church for three hours. And then they slowly, a few at a time, leave again. Knowing that if they get caught, it can cost them their life and imprisonment at the least and death at the worst. And we have folks in America who can't hardly make it to church one time a week. Well, I'm there Sunday morning. I mean, what more do you want? Isn't that amazing? 
If you don't have enough Christianity to get yourself to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, I doubt you'll have enough Christianity to face a gun to your head or renounce Jesus Christ. A faith that doesn't bring words of witnessing the gospel to your lips in a land where we have free speech to do so probably will not likely go and be burned at the stake or beheaded for a public testimony for Christ. You see, if, uh, if your faith doesn't help you obey now, it won't help you die then. I had a conversation with someone today, and they're having some marriage difficulty. I just told them, I said, you know what? It's time you get serious about God. It's time you get serious about your marriage. It's time you get serious about your children. There's no, there's no reason for two professing believers to say that we just need to, we just need to move apart for a while. No, you both need to get right with God and live for the Lord. That'll solve your marriage problem. And be serious about it. Are you living for him? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, except God. Now, that's living sacrifice. Because if you don't present him a living sacrifice, you'll never be a martyr. You won't die for him. I pray God would forgive us for having a half-hearted devotion to him. The time is here. The time is now. If ever we're going to do something for God, we need to do it now. And we need to stand up, stand up for Jesus. What we started the service with, stand on the promises of God. And Lord, I know that the day may come when we may have to die for you and we may have to give our life for you, but until then, God, help me live for you. Every day of my life, I want to live to bring glory to God. Not glory to me. If we lived that way, listen, there'd be a great peace in our lives. There'd be a great peace in our church. And you know what? There's a great reward waiting. Because the sufferings of this present time are nothing to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. And listen, if we're living right, if we're reminding people of Jesus Christ, we're going to suffer. We're going to suffer. And that's okay. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Is what God said. Jesus said, man, be happy about that. If you do it for the right reason. So we have, to, we have to learn to eliminate strife and to endure spite. If you can get through that, you're going to enjoy living for Christ. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And for the privilege, again, that's ours to open up your word and study it together. Lord, we, we pray now that we'll be doers of the word and not hearers only. I pray, God, that you'd help each of us tonight to, just now at our seat, Lord, commit ourselves afresh and anew to you, to say we will live for you. We'll be the living sacrifice. Lord, you know and I believe if we're not the living sacrifice, we'll never be the death sacrifice. Lord, prepare us for the persecution that will come if you tarry your coming. We want to stand fast in the faith. We want to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is never in vain in the Help us to keep our eye on the main thing. and Help us to get the gospel to every creature. Thank you for Brother Porter. Thank you for his report to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness. Please be with him and his family. Be with their travels. May they continue to have your hand upon his life. Now dismiss us with your care this evening, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Isn't he... Wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord? Wonderful.
That's how you sing it, all right? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? God bless you. You're dismissed. Brother Porter will be back at his table there. Make sure you see him tonight, all right?